Woe to the teachers of the law, the day of the saints is here. Woe to the teachers of the law, the kingdom of God is here. Welcome once again to God News Network, where the flesh meets the spirit and the saints are rising where we are here to fulfill the word of god the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now being revealed to the saints are you a saint how do you find out by studying the word of god you will realize that you can be a saint just by believing no, it's not based on how good you are. Good luck with that. It's not based on you at all. <laughs> Welcome to God News Network. We are so excited to be here with another show and continuing to do the wonderful mission of spreading the greatest news that has ever existed in all of the universe. And today we are continuing this awesome study on the book of Hebrews. No, it's not a description of a man making coffee. It is truly a wonderful description of the word of God coming to you, letting you know how free you are through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews is one of the coolest studies that you will ever do in the Bible, or at least I think so. I like the book. I think it's awesome because it really breaks down the detail between the priesthood and also between the covenants and what it means for you to follow covenant A versus covenant B. And we're going to get into those two covenants as we always do here. And fortunately, I have been blessed to have my good friend, St. Albert, back with us again this week, spreading this great news, teaching us more about Hebrews as he's coming to you live from the East Coast, calling in. Welcome, Albert. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to see my brother, Rick. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, gorgeous today. I uh I have a motorcycle. I was riding my motorcycle today. A front came last night, and they cleared the rock at the Smoky Mountains. And I mean, it was beautiful. You could see the glory of God. I mean, you could just <laughs> see those uh, those skies, blue skies with uh, puffy clouds that looked like they were floating. I mean, it was it was incredible. I mean, God is good. God is good, my brother. It was funny because before the show we were talking about that and how also my wife and I were out on the motorcycle as well. And my beautiful, beautiful daughter, uh, who is 15 years old, she uh, had to get some new shoes. And <clears throat> so I asked her, I said, well, what do you want to do to earn those new shoes? And she said, I'll clean up your motorcycle, Dad. And I said, great, <laughs> that's wonderful. So she did, and she did a marvelous job, absolutely fantastic job of cleaning up Grace, which is the name of my motorcycle, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good name. It is, and, it's, it, and she's pure white. <laughs> that's right. You know, a lot of a lot of times, Rick, people talk about material things of being a uh, things of the world and not liking the world and all that, and they get they get that confused a lot with the gifts that God has given us. You know, <laughs> they they think that uh, a lot of times uh, they preach about if you have a motorcycle, well, that might be a, a an earthly thing or earthly desires and all that, but that is far away from what God is actually talking about. Yeah, you know, the right. love of the world is not really loving the things of this world. There's a lot of things in this world that are gifts from God. Yes. And we praise Him, and, and, and we we thank the Lord, you know, uh, having a home, uh, enjoying a dinner, uh, enjoying a nice ride with your uh, family in the motorcycle or, or in a car. Or, those are not things of the world. They're gifts of God. All good you know, things what, come from God. That's correct. Now, what, what actually God is talking about is talking about falling in love with the system of yes. this world. Yes. In other words, falling in love with what this world tells you about the law, about 
trying to abide by laws, not that we, sh- we shouldn't abide by laws, but uh, the, the laws of the world, uh, you know, like our criminals and all that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about trying to become clean in God's eyes by your efforts and works, and that will never happen. And that is the system of this world, and that is the system of the God of this world, the devil, the God of the air, uh, he tries to get you involved in your own works. Well, and okay. you know, Albert, um, some good friends of mine, and including you, or we have had discussions similar, but God has showed me that there's three main systems that exist in the world that man uses to try to make themselves better than other men and uses these three systems to compare themselves to other men and women on the planet. And those three systems are the political system, the economic system, and the religious systems. Those three systems are constantly the most controversial things to discuss on the planet today. If you discuss politics, if you discuss money, and if you do, you discuss religion, those three things cause more headache than anything on the planet because they're made by man. There is a system that is outside of those three systems that is made by God. And that is his spiritual system through Jesus Christ. It's not religion like it was under the law. It is truly a freedom built on love. And that's what we're here to discuss today. Very well put, Albert. <clears throat> and we are going to pick up where we left off. I want to do a quick recap of uh, chapter 6 down through up to verse 7. And then we're going to pick up from there, from where we left off last time. It says in chapter 6, this is basically dealing with the peril of falling away. And what he's talking about is the peril is the thing that will come to you, which is death, if you fall away from faith of Jesus Christ by believing upon his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's see what it says. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And we, this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. That is a big warning for those who are leaving the law, then they taste Christ, and then they go back to the law again, which is their own effort, and then are crucifying Christ all over again. Albert, can you give us an example how that would occur in the world today with Christians? How are they doing this? What are some examples? Well, uh there's a lot of examples, but one example will be, uh, let's say, uh, well, for instance, uh, ourselves, uh, Rick, uh, God calls us saints, right? Right. And we're saints because we are pure, okay? Well, you know, if you think that you are a sinner, okay, you really haven't come to Christ yet because, you see, sin is of the law, Okay. So that means that the law, Christ, is the end of the law. So you haven't reached Christ yet. You believe and you think that you have reached Christ, but in reality you haven't. If you're, if, if Christ told you that he has taken every single way, every single sin that you have away from you, and that you are as pure as he is, 
and you're trying to make amends by him by confessing your sins and say and asking for forgiveness of those sins. Well, you're coming. It, it, it won't be like a sacrifice of sin, but it's a, a sacrifice for sin. But it still is a sacrifice because you're saying that your confession, okay, of your sins, which is what they use First John, which is completely like we talked about, completely out. What you're saying is that your confession of your sin is taking away your sin. So you're annihilating the cross. You're really not believing that the cross took away all your sins. You're saying it, but you don't believe it. Uh, that it's very controversial, but it is absolutely true. And most churches are not teaching that. Instead, they are allowing people to believe that it's okay to do that. That's, 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 it. that's correct, Rick. And the problem is, it might not seem like it's nothing, but it really is something. Anything that denies what Christ did on the cross is really something. Right. You know, these people, this people in Hebrew, they were denying Christ by going back again to doing their uh, sacrifices. Um, what can man... What can man, okay, you said, for example, if you call yourself a sinner, right, then you're basically mm -hmm. crucifying Christ all over again, because right. he, what Christ did was take away sin. It says it many That's times right. throughout the Word of God. So if he took away sin, then you're saying you're able to bring it back, which means his works didn't really occur, and it, he wasn't successful. Right. And for you to do That's that is correct. mocking what Christ did on the cross. That's correct. Notice that what it says there in Hebrews is that they tasted. You see, they tasted. They saw the works of the Spirit. They did right. that, but they never did believe it. So they let's. they were going back again. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Very well you said. Know, yeah, you know that uh, there's th that what what's going on in Hebrews is really basically religion, uh, right? And of course, we all know what Christ said uh, said about people coming to him at the end of times, telling him, "We did this, we did that, we did all this." And what did he tell them? He says, uh, "Get away from me." You workers of iniquity. I know you not. <laughs> I know you not. And this people, that's what's going to happen to this people right here in Hebrews. You know, let me, let, let's go for a second, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Rick, uh, to Proverbs 23, 7. I'm there. It says. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink. He says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. You see, uh, Rick, uh, a lot of times they uh, think that this, this uh, statements here have to do with, uh, with earthly things, but it's, it's actually a very spiritual uh, 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 thing that it's saying there. What it's actually saying is that... Uh, a lot of religious people are going to be blinded as to the goodness of, of the Lord. You know, the, the Hebrew people, they were in a desert, and they were denying the Lord by telling them that they didn't have, remember, the water? They didn't have the food? Uh, they were better off with the Egyptians? And they all died in the desert, right? And their hearts, they, they were seeing, just like religion today, they, they, they talk about Christ, and they talk about God. But in their hearts, they're denying them by the works that they're doing. Now, what's a, what, what I think, though, I think a lot of Christians do it out of ignorance, not out of willfulness. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I believe that. I believe that. Uh, and if I would I say on a, on a scale of 100%, I would say the majority of them are doing it out of ignorance. The ones yeah. that I really blame are the ones who are teaching no, that's correct. Because they, just as Christ blamed them as well, mm -hmm. you know, and they're the ones that should know, or some of them do and some of them don't. And again, actually, that goes back to the theology schools, because if we go back to the theology schools, a lot of them don't have this theology uh, 
understanding down. And they still also are mixing the two covenants, which is really what's happening here. Right. Right. Well, we're going to continue yeah. continue on here because you said that was a very spiritual statement, and that leads us to a really good spiritual statement that's in verse 7 here in Hebrews chapter 6. For those of you who are following, we're in Hebrews chapter 6, and I apologize if I had not mentioned that, but we're in Hebrews chapter 6, and we're in verse 7 now. It says, For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful for those who whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. So Albert, who is the ground that drinks rain? Uh, it's us. Uh, it's us, Rick. And, we drink the rain. And what is the rain? The rain is the spirit uh, bringing us all the uh, goodness of the spirit. Uh, what we should know about the spirit, the gospel, Christ. Well, what God shared. We are. What God shared with me is, if we, if we drink the rain, the rain actually has a name. The rain is Jesus. If we drink in Jesus which Jesus often falls on us. And it brings forth vegetation, fruit. If we're drinking in Jesus, it will automatically bring forth vegetation. Because God said, my word will not return void. Hmm. So his word is ringing, raining down on us. His word, just for, like now from the radio, as we read the word of God, it's raining down on you. It will bring forth this vegetation, this fruit. And it's useful to those for whose sake it is also meant or tilled. So it's meant mm -hmm. for you and it's useful for you. You and you, because of that, you receive a blessing from God. But with God, there's always the flip side. And here's the flip side. Verse 8, but if it yields thorn and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned. Really, this to me is a revealing the fruit is either vegetation or it's thorns and thistles. And those are the divisions of the covenants. Because if you try to do this on your own efforts under the law, which is really what he's talking about up there in this whole chapter so far, if you're doing this under the, the first covenant, the law, it's going to bring forth yields, thorns, and thistles. Think about it. Thorns and thistles hurt, right? What does the law do if you're constantly using the law to point out someone's sin? Does that hurt them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, it hurts them. And if you're constantly pointing out everything that they do wrong and how bad they are, you're mm. actually like thorns and thistles. You're mm. hurting them. When those who drink in Jesus would would never do that. Mm. Because and Jesus would have never done that either. No, he said, Mary, he said, where are your accusers now? He says that he was a friend of sinners, and he came not to judge the world, but to save it. Yeah, exactly. Hmm, it's awesome. So now we get into a, a change here. Now, um, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. It doesn't specifically say it, but it's Pauline to me. And mm -hmm. better things for you is really what this next part is about. We're in verse 9. It says, but, beloved... Beloved, I love that word. Mm -hmm. We are convinced of better things concerning you, just as we are our audience. We're convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God mm -hmm. is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Mm -hmm. 
And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, here's a question for you, Albert. What came first, the promise of God or the law? The promise of God. The promise of God has been there since the beginning. 430 years before God gave Moses the law, he gave mm-hmm. Abraham the promise. And 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 uh, just to say also, brother, even before, before the foundations of the earth, it was understood by Christ what he said, that before the foundations of the earth, that he was going to save the world. It that's was going to be right. through him. That's right. So the promise it's always the been promise there. Has always been there. Uh, man was never going to be uh, saved by the by the works of his own uh, hands. And all the way, as we talked about it, all the way from Adam and Eve, uh, with the knowledge of uh, 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 the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and and Cain and Abel, with uh, the works that they did, uh, rejection of Cain's work because it was his own work. Uh, it was a symbol of man's work, and throughout the whole Bible, it's always been the same, and it's always been uh, from the beginning, all the way from Enoch, uh, even Enoch, uh, uh, a preacher of righteousness, uh, righteousness does not come from the law. And Enoch was way before Moses, so we're talking about Christ, and we're one of the, about Christ, and one of the questions we get is then why has Christianity gotten so messed up? Matter of fact, I heard a question earlier today. Someone says, why why in the world, she asked, why in the world then can't everybody just get along even within Christianity? And actually, we were talking before the show, and you brought it up in Jude. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Jude, Jude only has one chapter, so it's easy to get there. It's the book right before Revelation. And in Jude, it says in verse 4, here's why Christianity gets totally jacked up. Verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They creep in distorting the grace of God. Oh, and and here's an example. If someone comes in and says, yes, God forgave you, but you're still a sinner. Would you say that that would qualify as men creeping in unaware? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the nine, again, uh, the same thing for the both sides, including the first one, they're, they're the nine. You're, cu- what he did. You're cutting out on me, Albert, just oh. a little bit here. Yeah, they're the nine Christ and what he did uh, by saying that. Well, and here's another example. What if someone says to you, um, Yes, Jesus saved you, absolutely, but there is none righteous, no, not one. A misunderstanding of what God is saying. Uh, There is righteous. Righteousness comes from Christ. It doesn't come from the law. If you're looking at through the lens of the law, there is none righteous. But remember that the law was taken away 2,000 years ago. And now what we have is Christ. But I know the verse, and I've heard it a thousand times in church. There is none righteous, no, not one. Wait a minute. They they need to continue reading, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's what. That's what. That's the problem. That's the problem. They only read a little verse. Yep. Because if you continue reading in Romans three, there it says the next one says, "But now there's a righteousness apart from the law that even the law and the prophets testified to." And this righteousness comes by the faith of Jesus Christ mm. unto all and upon all who believe. Question, do Nothing. you believe? Yes. Then you're righteous. Then you're righteous. <laughs> There's lots now, of... Now, why is it? 
why is it, Rick, that when they read that, they don't read the other half? It happens all the time. We're all sinners huh? and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> There's another one, right? <laughs> yeah. But it says if you continue, but we're freely justified through Christ Jesus. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's amazing why... It's amazing how they 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 forget to read the second half. Finish the sentence. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Now you were you were in Jude. Uh, let me let me uh, read you uh, Jude eleven for okay. a second, because so, it goes back to what we were talking about. It says, and these are these people that are creeping into the churches that First John also talked about. In fact, this most all the places in the Bible talk about it. It says, Woe unto them, they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and per, uh, and perish in the uh, gainsaying of Kor. Now, it's amazing that they come back and they talk about Cain, because Cain is a representation of the law. You That's see? right. It's a representation of the, of the law, and Balaam, well, we, we uh, I don't know if people know about it, but he was trying to sell, he was trying to sell God. That's, that was one of his errors. <laughs> yeah, didn't but, he, um, didn't he want to, didn't, wasn't he the one that also, he wanted to profit from selling God? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So again, it's all about uh, uh, about works and and not knowing God. You know, Cain uh, with his sacrifice, uh, 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 man, a uh, big sacrifice. I bet Cain sacrificed, and we would have seen it, uh, and we would have seen Abel's sacrifices. Uh, 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 if we would have seen an immense standard, we would have said, "Wow, man, how how can the Lord deny this sacrifice?" You know. Yeah, but it was man's efforts, you know. And and to explain those to those who may not know, under Cain, how how is he a representation of the law? Do you want to explain it, or do you want me to? Sure, uh, you can go ahead and explain it, bro. Go ahead. Yeah, well, Cain's Cain's sacrifice to God was Cain was tilling the ground with his own efforts, his own mm-hmm. works, his works produced the crops, and. With Abel, it was God raised up this sheep. It was the best sheep <laughs> in the <laughs> flock. It w- had nothing to do with the ability of Abel to do anything, where Cain was proud of his crops and how hard he worked mm-hmm. at making those cra- making the crops beautiful for, for him. Mm-hmm. So it was tilling the ground, the soil, and it was done by the hands of man, which is Cain. And that is a complete representation of the law because the law is based on whose efforts? Mm, man's efforts. Man's <laughs> efforts. Man's ability <laughs> not to not to lie, not to steal, not to covet. And that's based upon your ability. Mm-hmm. Where the grace or the new covenant under Christ was based on Christ's ability, not yours. It was mm-hmm. God's ability. And man can't do it and he did he can't earn it he can't earn it it's not possible because jesus did it all mm-hmm. that's the you good know, news I could just, that's great news you know i could just imagine uh abel i see him like in the story of uh, jonah you know you remember when jonah uh gets up there and and god hope, um, puts up a little plant on top of him to shade him off, and there he is sleeping underneath the, <laughs> the plant. <laughs> I could see, I, I could just see Abel underneath a shade tree there in the middle of the afternoon, dozing off and just sleeping there. Yeah. And I could... I could <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's mad at Abel because he's sleeping. Yeah. What? Are you kidding? He's, he's in his rest, man. He's in his rest. <laughs> And just like the prophets and just like the disciples and just like the apostles, everybody who got into that rest was killed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? That's amazing. Yeah. It is. And continuing on in that, in the vein of what you were reading there, mm-hmm. he goes on to describe there, clouds without water carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, 
raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints mm. to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them from all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Mm. Now, these apostates were predicted Mm -hmm. In verse 16, who are these people? These are grumblers, complainers. Now, wait a minute. He's saying these people are the worst of the worst, and these are just complainers mm -hmm. walking mm -hmm. according to their own desires, own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, mm -hmm. but you, beloved, Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. And these are the sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Mm. Now, that, that is something. But let's, let's do a little explanation on this, because people uh, have always been taught that all these this people were, were coming into the uh, churches, you know, maybe like doing worldly things, saying by words, you know, doing sins. That's not what it's called, swelling, uh, swelling words speaking great swirling words, these people are actually people of the law. People, uh, and, and uh, if you go back to 12, uh, all this hidden rocks, uh, you know, uh, unseen danger, that's what they represent. Waterless clouds, you know, false promises of the Old Testament, false promises, not of the Old Testament, but of what they promised about the law, you know. Um, raging waves, you know, their, their efforts, wasted efforts, uh, barren trees, you know, uh, trees that don't bear fruit, you know. The Holy Spirit always bears fruit on people, always. A believer is always bearing fruit. If you're not a believer, you're not bearing fruit, because it's, it's the Holy Spirit that bears fruit through you, you see? Right. So what these people are, who they are, are actually people of the law, and you see from churches, and uh, and this and the words that they use and all that are always condemning words, are always words that deny the cross. They're words that deny who you are, your identity in Christ. Uh, if you do anything, you know, I mean, how many folks out there know that there's something wrong in the churches? Uh, have been kicked out of churches. Uh, find that there's no love in churches. Because they, most of the churches are not working with the Spirit. They're people of the law. These right. people have been crept up all the way from the beginning. All the way from the beginning, they've been in churches. They've been in synagogues. They've been all over the place. They're the works of the devil. Those people have been there, placed, and some of them don't even know it. They're there by ignorance and, and just spilling out the works of the devil, which is self-righteousness. Okay, self -righteousness. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example mm -hmm. then in the Bible where it talks about the man who comes in and is doing wrong in the church. I think it's Corinthians. And they're instructed to kick the man out of the church so that his soul may be saved. How do you deal with that? And I know that you and I know this, but for our audience, how do you deal with that? Right now, that man though is not what uh, is not what they're talking about over here in in uh, in uh, you know what they're talking back here. In, they're in, talking uh, about the law here, but and Jude, right? And yeah. Jude, what they're talking about is not that lasciviousness. 
just so, so just so pe- people will understand that lasciviousness and all that that they're talking about those people in Jude are not that person in First Corinthians. Well, so what's the difference then, Albert? What's the difference between the one in Corinthians and the one here? Because these guys here obviously are doing wrong. They're talking about the law. So what's the difference between the guy in Corinthians and here? What's the why would the guy in Corinthians be kicked out of church? Well, the the thing is with the guy in Corinthians is that uh, he was he was uh, supposedly what had happened is that he was uh, a person who was openly. Uh, um, openly uh, having a uh, an affair, supposedly with his uh, uh, his uh, stepmother. The in-laws, okay? yeah, that's right. Yeah, her stepmother. Um, uh, the thing is, is, is this um, that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is perfect. Okay, the Holy Spirit is perfect. Right. Uh, the way that the church is supposed to handle a person inside of the church, okay, is supposed to be that uh, supposed to treat him like a Gentile. Okay. What? How do you treat a Gentile? Does Christ treat a Gentile unfairly? Does God treat a Gentile bad? No, He loves him. He loves him. Okay. What is it? How is it that God does with people who don't know him? What he does is that he teaches them, okay? And and he teaches them in a lovely and in, in, in a loving way, okay? To bring him towards him. He teaches him with, his, with with who he is, with the love that he is and all that and with the truth. Okay? Now, when that person, when that person is continuing continuing on in a church, and 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 is continuing on with the same thing in church, or with the sin that he's been caught on, okay, uh, that person is acting like if he's not a believer, he's not he's not listening to the spirit, or maybe. He didn't have the spirit in the beginning, right? Because, because he the, the he spirit. and he hasn't come to the end of himself. That's correct. The he, spirit is is perfect, and the spirit convicts people of their righteousness. So maybe that person wasn't righteous. Uh, you know, it could be that the person from the beginning wasn't righteous. Uh, now, so it then how do you, also, how do you kick him out, and how does that save his soul? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't do. Know, I do. Let, okay. let, let's deal with that. Because what happens is, think about, you're, you're going to be, when you're kicked out of church for something you did wrong, you're going to mm-hmm. come to the end of yourself, and now you're kind of like, um, you, you need help. But you don't realize mm-hmm. that as long as you're allowed to continue doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Only until there is some sort of a consequence that does occur, mm-hmm. you know, that you've hurt someone. Mm-hmm. Then you, then you, when you come to the realization that you've hurt someone, mm-hmm. then you mm-hmm. want to change. It's kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, someone who's addicted to alcohol. Until the person mm-hmm. realizes that they have a problem, A, B, they they want to change, they can't. Mm-hmm. Because there's there's something that is the enemy of God that's blocking that process to occur. Mm-hmm. And that process is being blocked by pride. Mm-hmm. Because if you think what you're doing is good and mm. you don't see that this is wrong, then you're right, mm. Albert. I think I think if you don't see that what you're doing is wrong, I think something is mm. not in there. Something's missing. Mm. Mm. So until that's dealt with, and you yourself come to the realization that I do have a problem and that I do need help, 
then God is immediately going to give you love. He's immediately going to say, come here, sit on my lap. I've got mm-hmm. you. But mm-hmm. you can't do that if pride is there. It's not possible. Mm-hmm. It's like an iron curtain that, that's blocking you from receiving your blessings. I look at it like this. Look up in heaven. And if you're in the audience with me, pretend you're doing this with me. Look up in heaven. And I want you to picture this ultimate huge funnel that is connected from heaven to you in your heart and your inner inner self. And through this huge funnel are all these blessings and all the promises in the entire Bible for you. Wealth, health, all of it. It's all there. When you think you have the answers or when you believe that you can do it without God or you believe that you don't need God, you need your drugs, your alcohol or something, it isn't that God doesn't love you. It isn't that he doesn't care for you and it isn't that he doesn't have salvation for you. It's you are squeezing that funnel off so that the blessings now can't get to you. Does that make sense? Mm, mm, it's like you're, yeah. you mm. are squelching off the blessings of God because you won't receive. You, you're not receiving because pride is in the way and you don't need God. Pride is blocking yeah. it. Yeah. Or, or maybe you are receiving it, but you don't see it because of the pride that you have. Yeah. It, exactly. Pride is still blocking it one way or another. And pride is the enemy. That's why you have to be humbled. And the only way a church can deal with certain things, if they've come to them and tried to deal with them and they're still not doing it, is by kicking them out, you become possibly humbled. And therefore, your soul might be saved. And You know, I was thinking about uh, something right now, Rick. It's also, you know... uh, the works that we do, the right, the, the 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 attitudes that we have here uh, on Earth, uh, if we have wrong attitudes, we convey to the world something wrong about about God because we are we are part of God. You see, right? So for this person to be inside of a community of God's people. And conveying that out as to what he's doing, that we're no better off than the people outside. You see, he's giving bad a bad name to God. Right, see? misrepresentation so, of of God. It's a misrepresentation of God. So I agree. The only way they have to take him out because he's represent is misrepresenting what God is all about. You see, mm-hmm. and and just like uh, just like not feeding the uh, the people inside of a church, you know. Church is not taking care of their people and using money for other things. Uh, that's a, also a misrepresentation, which God talks about that too, you know. Right, right. They're, they're misrepresent, misrepresenting God. The body of God is re- misrepresenting God. So... You know, I will see that also they might have been kicking him out too because of that mis- misrepresentation of God. <laughs> this is whether a- he's safe, whether he's safe or not. Uh, you know, the Bible says, you know, that re- that not to judge people by the works of their flesh. That's the judgment. You see, you hear a lot of people saying, "Well, the Bible says that we shouldn't judge." The Bible says, you know, we should not judge each other. We should not judge. Well, they're they they're not understanding what that is saying. Right. What that actually is saying is, by the works of the flesh, you cannot judge anybody whether they're safe or not safe. No, you see, not that you cannot judge your brother. I could come if you if you're doing something wrong. I could come to you and tell you, hey, brother, I am sorry, but what you're doing is wrong. It's it's not of your character. It's not who you are. And you're making the body of Christ look bad. Very, very well said, Albert. And this is a, an incredibly great segue into I think that's the problem with the churches today is not enough 
saints are standing up and saying, wait a minute, time out. We're not under the law anymore. Mm-hmm. So People make judgments. Who should be kicked out? The ones who are teaching us that you that are taking away from Christ. Yeah. And that's where uh, this and, that's where this is at. Yeah. We're we're called to judge. In fact, <laughs> there's so much that we're called to judge that in the end, who's gonna be doing the judgment? We are. we are. We're gonna be judging the world. So how could how could uh, uh, one time it says that we can't judge and another time we could judge? No, well, what it's talking about is not make a judgment right now, whether some, uh, whether a person is saved or not, because of their works of the flesh. Because you cannot, by the works of the flesh, you cannot identify anybody. Well, in First Corinth, First Corinthians chapter six, verse two, it says, "Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous?" And not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? <laughs> yeah. We could judge. What we cannot do is judge people whether they're according saved. to the works, whether they're saved or not. Because, exactly right. In fact... Who's the ones who are going to be separating those people? It says the angels and the last day are going to be separating the shaft from the wheat. And it says for us not to be involved in that. Yeah, he said, and he's going to gather everybody. And then we're going to separate the chaff from the wheat because just in case the the wheat might get burned. We don't want that. That's that's correct. (laughs) So if we make a call right now, on somebody because of the works that they're doing in the flesh, we could actually injure a brother or a sister, not knowing that that person is actually safe, but it's just working in the flesh. You see, we could actually injure them because we're not capable of doing that now. Right. Well, let's pick. Let's go back to chapter six in Hebrews and pick up at verse thirteen. Uh, you know, this is such a complex study, and that's why we've had to take this, I call it a sidebar, so that we can explain some things that really deal with this. And, you know, God just always takes over, you know, how it works on the show. Where verse 13, it says, For when God made, we're in chapter 6, verse 13 in Hebrews, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. So men swear by God, or someone greater than themselves, where God swore by himself. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, comma, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner before us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Mm. Mm. Now we're in chapter... Mm. Go ahead. Yeah, that's amazing when it says an anchor. I mean, in other words, it's unmovable. (laughs) <laughs> yep. It's anchored in, and when God anchors it, it's solid. Mm-hmm. Chapter 7, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness and then also king of salem which is the king of 
peace. Peace. Yeah. <laughs> without mm-hmm. father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Mm. Now, ob- I wonder who that is. Yeah. Hmm. Now, observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren. Also, these are descendants from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So Abraham was blessed by him. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, you know, this this is uh, always used for the tithes, but, you know, in the churches. And as you could see there, uh, it's really talking about the Jewish people and, and about the law, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and again, you know, it talks about 10%, uh, that, uh, Abraham gave it. It's, it's not talking about the other, uh, percentages by the law that, that Abraham should have given it. There was a law at that time. Remember, Abraham was before the law, right? And that's why they say, oh, tithing was before the law. Well, no, this, this right here, what it's talking about is about the Levite priests that, uh, by law, they didn't have to pay tithing because they were working in the temple you see and they had no time for work uh, to work outside to uh to uh to produce or or money or whatever it was needed to pay for the temple so uh abraham through abraham they will they were accounted like if they have paid their tithes you see so that's all that is talking about there. A- Again, Abra- talking abraham about- covered everybody by that tent yeah. That's correct. That's what you're saying. So Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils, and those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth of the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descendants from Abraham. But the one whose mm-hmm. genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of his father, Melchizedek, met him. So he's saying that the Levi priesthood paid his tithes through Abraham. The priesthood, yeah, and uh, and and we as being priests, we don't pay tithes either. Uh, again, we are all priests, and uh, and you could see that uh, when uh, in uh, in the Gospels, when uh, Jesus Christ is with, with Peter, and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, the church leaders come to them and tells Peter, he, Peter is outside and tells him, "Hey, Peter, you know." Uh, does you and your master, do you guys pay uh, church tax? And uh, Peter says, oh, yeah, we sure do, yeah. <laughs> we sure pay it. And he goes inside, and Christ tells him, he goes, hey, Peter, does the sons of the king pay tax? And Peter says, no. And he says, neither do we, Peter. But just so you won't offend them, Peter, go out and catch the first fish and take those coins out of his mouth and go ahead and pay them for me and you. Okay. So we're not bound by any tithes or anything. The only thing that we're bound us is that we are a body, and if we see any of the brothers in the body in need, or anybody in need because of, of the creation, uh, we are to help them. That's, That's what just, we're bound uh, uh, about. You know, we're bound to help them. Out of the law of love. That's correct. Not and, out uh, of the and, law and, of tithing. That's correct. And it says in the Bible that... Uh, 
if you have somebody who's doing something, like in church, like a pastor, you know, that, that he deserves to be paid, you know, anybody who, uh, he deserves to be paid, but uh, as to legally have to pay, you don't. We're not legally, uh, by God's standards or anything, uh, have to pay for anything. Uh, the only thing that we're supposed to do is if your brothers in need meet that need. Uh, and uh, that's where, now, you know, the uh, we could help with God's, uh, uh, w- with uh, the gospel, you know. It, it costs money nowadays to bring the co- gospel out, you know. People are working in the gospel, and, they're, and it costs money, you know. But the problem is, is that it's being abused. It's gone all the way to the other side. Uh, you know, now you're seeing uh, abuses in the churches of that money that's coming in, and nobody in the in the church, which is supposed to be the first thing, of uh, the people in the church who are in, need help, those were the first ones who were supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, that money was supposed to be used for. But now it's being abused. Uh, they're building cathedrals, uh People are uh, lavishing in, 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 their, in their living, you know, expensive cars, expensive houses, expensive trips, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, well, Rick. And that's another show. <laughs> yes, that's another show. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on. Verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, and I'm going to read in the quotations here, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. So that's what the Levitical priesthood was under. Now, if the perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? So if it was obtainable through the Levitical priesthood, then why would we need another priest through Melchizedek? Well, let's figure it out. Verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of the law also so instead of the the priesthood through the order of um the levites the levitical priesthood now there's a priesthood through melchizedek which actually was preceding the levitical priesthood that's correct and 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 uh it's a different you know we're serving remember from all the way from the beginning we had two husbands right the 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 tree of life and the and the tree of knowledge of good and evil that's right we are priests of a new husband, you see? Mm-hmm. So it, uh, we're different priests. We're, we don't resemble the old priests, you see? Uh, our duties are completely different. <laughs> That's right. We don't have to do sacrifices. Uh, <laughs> Thank <because> God. <laughs> the, the sacrifices were already done, you see? But yet... Uh, what but, are we priests at? But yet... We're, well, yeah, I'm sorry. It, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. We're priests. Uh, well, what are we priests of? Well, we're ministers of reconciliation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you see, uh, so we're we're completely different of our old priesthood, and we're going to be priests, believe it or not, just like Christ, that we live forever. The old the old priesthood, they died, <laughs> but this new priesthood, we're going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're running short here on the show, and we're going to have to pick up next time uh, here in chapter seven, uh, verse thirteen. But you know, this understanding of this priesthood can really help you understand that you're not under the law, and under the law, you can never achieve perfection. It's just not possible. And, you know, we can call it the law, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the 613 Levitical Commandments, or you can call it your effort, your human effort. It's not possible. And if we continue to try to do it under our own effort, we're going to continually feel like we're running into a brick wall. For those of you who are listening, please accept the only priesthood that will ever set you free. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you do that just by saying, Jesus, I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I receive you, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask that you show me the way from here forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, 
And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Albert, thank you so much for tuning or for being here with us and doing these shows. This is a blessing, brother. It's a blessing to have you and and part of God News Network and uh, just part of my life and my family's life. And I just wanted you to know that as we get ready to sign off so that you would know you are truly loved, Albert. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, and thank you to my wonderful audience who continues to grow. Please tell everyone about GodNewsNetwork.com. That's GodNewsNetwork.com. May you be blessed forevermore. <laughs>